Hi, I'm Lance Lambert. I got my hands full right now. I'll be right with you. You crashed there, Aaron. It's you. Oh, it you're is You're number one. I am number one. Uh, hey, and you're number one, and you are watching the Vintage Vehicle Show. We are in the Flying A Garage in Pasadena, California. Our host here, Aaron Weiss. Thank you for, uh, see, now I can take advantage. He left it, put his hand off the thing. See, I'm ahead of you now. Yeah. Uh, we are Aaron's guest here. You may recall we had Aaron on the show in the past with a couple of his really nice cars at the uh, L.A. Concours. It was a great show, and he was gracious enough to invite us here to the Flying A Garage. So we're going to take a look at some cars right after I give Aaron a good dusting here. Are you all right with Oh, no, that's me. I keep spinning out here. All right, we'll be right with you. Aaron, thank you so much for having us out here at your Flying A Garage. This is really cool. H how did this come about? Well, it was a long, uh, long evolution, but uh, used to have the cars at home, and then we had too many cars, and there wasn't enough room at home, and opportunity came to buy the building, and here we are. Uh -huh. Your goal here was just to have a place to store them and take a look at them, enjoy them, or what did you have in mind? A combination of both, a place where we could enjoy them and come in and look at them and entertain a little bit and uh, work on them, and just kind of a multi-purpose uh, facility. Mm -hmm. And we do a lot of entertaining here, and uh, a lot of people come by and look at the cars, and you can just come by and have a have a coke and watch the watch the cars or take them out. So there's there's a lot to do here. Uh huh. Well, entertaining. That's kind of a good segue into this car, uh, 42 Packard Darren, uh, mm -hmm. done by Dutch Darren way back when, and and he dealt with a lot of people that did a lot of entertaining. So what's the history on this car? Well, this car uh, was the last year of the, of, of the Darrens. Uh, you go back to 1938, uh, and Darren was in Hollywood with his shop, and he was really chopping cr uh, Packards. Uh, the Darren Swoop uh, on the belt line is his trademark, took off the running boards and he was building these cars uh, custom built for various movie stars and uh, entertainment moguls. Uh, Packard heard of him somehow and offered him $10,000 to design a new car in 10 days, mm -hmm. which he did and that's the Packard Clipper. And in that relationship, uh, they found that he was buying the cheapest Packards and chopping them up. And so they entered into an agreement where they would provide him uh, 180s, which were the larger uh, V8s, and he would modify them. Uh, the first year, uh, they went to Central Manufacturing, which was the company that uh, uh, was, had been building all of the cords and uh, uh, the cords in Auburn's. Uh, and uh, that didn't last long because uh, Central got a contract to build Jeeps. So they kicked him out, and he ended up, I think it's called Hessen Einstadt, who's the uh, Hurston Ambulance oh, right. Builder. And they ended up building him for the last couple of years, and this is the, the final year. And they just got better and better and better. So I think the, by 1942, all the bugs in the construction process had been b uh, worked out, and then the war came, and that was the end of uh, the Darrens. Yeah. This particular power plant on this, did uh, D Dutch Darren did the design and the outside, obviously, but how about, uh, did he hop them up at all? No, there was no, uh, this is just a, this is the largest straight eight that Packard made that year, and there's no modifications to the running, uh, the uh, drivetrain or anything else in the car, strictly the body. And if you lift the body panels or get underneath the car, the welds were not done with artistic uh, grace. They're, they're, they're there. They're, it's, it was pretty much uh, torched and welded and uh, it's not pretty. 1931 Rolls-Royce, winner of Pebble Beach. You have the lineage of the car on there. Pretty special. Well, thank you. We enjoy the car a lot. Uh, my original passion was Rolls-Royces, and I think if I had a choice of a car, I wanted a Rolls-Royce limousine at some point in time, and this is an open town car, which is even better. Uh, four years of restoration, and uh, I won't tell you how many layers of skin. Uh, but uh, here we are, and it's been a pleasure. And this is one of the cars we're going to show a lot this year, and uh, we're looking forward to it. It runs great. It's great on a rally. It's great at a show. It's just been a, a real pleasure to own. Uh -huh. uh, one of the things that's confusing to me, I've, I've heard the explanation, and I sort of grasp it for about 30 seconds, and then it goes. Uh, the chassis at a certain point, era were shipped over here and the bodies were built in the U.S. and then everything happened in England and then what, explain that. Well, 19, uh, in the late 1900s, uh, nine, well, like 1918, Rolls determined that they were not doing well against Packard and Cadillac and they needed to have faster delivery and so they decided to open up a plant in Springfield, Massachusetts, which they did. Uh, that plant was open from 1921 to 1931. 
they opened the plant and that took away the need to have chassis imported to the United States. The other thing that everybody has to uh, understand is that high-end luxury cars were sold as a running chassis only. The body, the, 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 the coach was made by a coach builder and expedited by the dealer. So uh, for that 10-year period, you bought the, the running chassis from a Rolls-Royce dealer who expedited the coach. During that same period of time, Rolls also saw that Cadillac and Packard were offering their own bodies. And so they were even, even though the chassis were here now, they were even offering faster uh, delivery because people wanted to buy them off the floor. Americans didn't need to have a custom body made. They were happy buying them whatever was offered. So they bought Brewster, which was an old line carriage builder and had been building coaches. So this particular car is a 1931 Phantom II. No Phantom IIs were built in Springfield. They ended production with the last Phantom Ones in, in 1931. So this car just kind of piggy, you know, back to back with that production change. But it came here as a chassis and then a Brewster body was put on it. You could have had any body you wanted, but uh, this one uh, got the standard American body. Uh -huh. The motor on it, when people bought a Rolls-Royce, of course they wanted quality and excellent engineering and that's one of the reasons they bought it, but was performance an issue with these cars or if they just got from point to point B comfortably, people were happier or did they want something they knew they could cruise at, at 100 miles an hour if they well, chose to? Well, you could, but Rolls were just absolutely reliable and they lasted forever in that time frame of thought. Uh, so uh, you got a lot of quality and you've got a lot of performance. And the cars were quiet. You can barely hear the thing. When you start it up, you can barely hear that it's on. If you're sitting in the back uh, passenger's compartment, you don't know it's on. It runs smooth. There's no vibration when it's right. And uh, the thing just glides down the street. Uh -huh. Pebble Beach, I think everyone thinks of as the, the top of the pecking order for that uh, league of automobiles. What was it like participating uh, in that show and in, in the other shows uh, at Pebble that you've done? High anxiety uh, would be the best. Uh, it was really a thrill to be there uh, and uh, we were really thrilled that we were able to take a class prize, but it was a lot of work and uh, a lot of anxiety because you're competing against the best cars. There's, no, there's not really any uh, beaters there and so you know when you hit the the, the, the uh, show field that the car next to you is going to be as good if not better than yours so you you leave nothing to chance and you're obsessing over things you would never obsess with again. Aaron is Elvis in the house? Coming. Coming yeah this, <laughs> this looks like Elvis ought to be driving this uh, 58 Cadillac? Eldorado Barretts. Uh -huh. um, we've had it for about five six years um, bought it uh, from a doctor in uh, St. Louis and the car came and it looked like he had taken it to Tijuana and they'd sprayed everything green. Uh -huh. I mean everything, seats, top, uh -huh. sides, everything. And uh, did a frame off restoration and uh, showed it real heavily in about 2004, I'd say. Uh -huh. This was uh, a lot of the styling cues on this went on with Cadillac. I mean, of course, the, the fins kept getting bigger and bigger. Uh, what kind of impact do you think this had on the, the automotive world when it came out? Well, I think that the post-Korean uh, War period was really interesting uh, from the standpoint that I think people, by the time 1958 came around, men had come out of the service, gone to school, pursued a career, and now it was time to say, look what I've accomplished. And so I think there's a lot of bling during this period of time because people wanted to show off. Look what we've accomplished. Uh -huh. And Cadillac, uh, I remember when our neighbors across the street bought a Cadillac. It's like, wow, they, they have really arrived. So, Well, not only had you arrived, but you certainly wouldn't want to drive the same one for more than a year or so because then people would want to know what happened. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what happened to you? You don't have a new Cadillac. Uh -huh. So we were only good for a short period of time. But... Uh, this is a, a wonderful car to drive, and uh, the color in the chrome just really set it, uh, set it out. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of car that you can show up at the Concours, or you can show up at the Good Guys show, or you can show up at Bob's Big Boar, or you can show up anywhere, and, and people will fall to their knees and worship it, I would think. Oh, yeah, it's, it's definitely a crowd pleaser, and uh, there's a lot of detail on the car that... Um, it doesn't go unnoticed, and I think people appreciate it, and uh, 
it is a it is a car for all seasons. Uh, we were uh, talking earlier about how at the opening of the show we were playing with the uh, slot cars, and you'd mentioned that you'd had a function here, and the kids just kind of didn't get it. Why would you do this when you could go to the computer and play, uh, you know, video game slot cars or whatever? What kind of reaction do you get from, say, teenagers on down to a car like this? Well, I, I've not found anyone who doesn't like it. Even my own children, uh, who aren't into a lot of the classics that we have, really think this is a hot car uh -huh. and dad could we have it for the prom no uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, uh, you know could we take it out and for a spin I really think not uh -huh. but it really uh, these kind of cars have a lot just have a, a, a lot of appeal uh, I think one reason is a lot of people had them and so they can relate to them. Maybe their own family didn't have them, but maybe an uncle or an aunt or a grandfather or somebody had one and so there's, they can relate to it. They saw them. Mm -hmm. How's the performance on this? It's, it's a tank. Uh, it moves, but it, uh, we took it on one rally and it did fairly well, but it's not a sports car. Right. And it's, it, it, it's sloppy. Uh -huh. I mean, it's a, it's a land yacht. You got to hold the steering wheel with both hands or you'll be in multiple lanes uh -huh. uh, before you know it. Uh, it but all in all, it's a nice cruiser. Uh -huh. you know, it, it's the kind of car you might want to have at your beach house and uh, cruise, uh, cruise the Esplanade or you know whatever ma the main drag, and uh, it'd be a fun car to, uh -huh. to have there. Well, speaking of uh, holding the steering wheel with both hands, there's another Cadillac down here that I'd love to have both hands on the steering wheel a bit. Can we take a look? Sure. All right, Claire and I made reference to. Elvis in the house on the other one, but I know Elvis owned one of these, a 58 Cadillac Brome. Yes, I understand he did. And uh, these were a really rare car. In 1956, Ford came out with the Continental Mark II, which was a hand-built car, and General Motors would not be, you know, uh, one-upped. Uh -huh. So they came out with the Brome. The Brome was a hand-built car, not on a production line as such. And uh, it had a manufacturer suggested retail price of $12,500. At that point in time, you could have bought the next best Cadillac, Oldsmobile, Pontiac, and Chevrolet for less than $12,500. In fact, some homes cost less than $12,500. Needless to say, the car was a little overpriced. General Motors lost about $12,000 on each one they sold because they couldn't advertise the the, the tools and dies, uh -huh. and um, they only sold, I believe, a little over 800 of them, uh, of which this is a 1958. The 57s and 58s, the only difference is tri-power in the uh, 58s and dual quads in the 57. The most distinctive thing on these, of course, I mean, there's a lot that is, but uh, the roof on a stainless steel roof, what, what were they, not that they were thinking wrong, but what were they thinking? Uh, one up Ford. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, it, it has suicide doors, the stainless steel roof. Everybody asked me, is this, was this a standard uh, uh, feature on the car? There were no options. Uh, the car was way ahead of its time. It had memory seats, automatic door locks, uh, it had uh, temperature control air. Uh, the car rode originally on air shocks as opposed to uh, pneumatic shocks. Uh, it was just way ahead of its time and the price is indicative of that and people weren't ready to pay for it. And this came equipped with a vanity set, you said? Yes, it came uh, equipped with an Arpege atomizer, cross pin, uh, and a powder puff and a um, compact, a woman's compact lis lipstick holder. And then you open up the uh, glove compartment and it's, uh, you have these magnetized cups, brandy cups that will sit on there. I guess that was before uh, DUIs were not in fashion. And uh, it has uh, a couple other little goodies in there, paper pad and things, a comb and a brush. And this was, the, today, uh, I mean, that makes the value of the car is if you have the vanities or not. We're, we're, we're talking for for the, the, the shot glass and for the pen and for the makeup thing or whatever, like fifteen to $25,000, right? Yeah, depending on their condition. It, yeah, it's a lot more than you, it, you would think for just a couple little doodads uh, that fit in the uh, car. Uh, performance on this, were they still uh, like the last one, just kind of a, a luxury, uh, take a while to get to the top end, or were they thinking anything different on performance on this? Well, it's a heavy car to begin with, and I think that, that weights it down, and so it's not a zero to 60 in four seconds. But once you get going, it's a real smooth, quiet car. 
car. Everybody knows what a Woody is. Most everybody, if you had, if you asked the general public, give me a car that's, that you think of as warm and fuzzy, somewhere near the top or maybe at the top would be any Woody because they just, you like them, they're like teddy bears. How could you not like a, a Woody? Uh, 46 uh, Chrysler Town & Country here? Absolutely, uh -huh. uh, two-door convertible coupe. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a car I bought um, on a Lark I wanted one, and then all of a sudden there it was, and jumped right on it. Uh, and it was in pretty good shape when we bought it, but not quite there. And this is a car that over the long term, every year we do something to it. So originally we had the wood redone, and then uh, we had the paint rubbed out, and did some of the chrome, and then lifted it up. And the, the undercarriage is actually better than the top side. Mm -hmm. wow. What you don't see is better than what you are seeing. But the town and countries were uh, interesting cars. They were first conceived up just right before World War II. And they made a barrel back station wagon for those 41 and 42. The war came, had to stop uh, civilian production of automobiles. And then in 1946, they kind of had to start, uh, they, they were allowed to make uh, cars again. And there wasn't a whole lot of design time, so a lot of the styling cues just came from whatever was before. And they had the dies, and they kind of made the cars up, and here we go. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, this is the first model after the war. Is there any characteristic to, to these woodies to where you're driving them? You can tell that there's a different structural? Well, I think it's a little more creaking okay. in the true woodies. Now, as you went through the, 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 40, the late 40s, Chrysler started cheat. And so by the end, they used Dynock, which is in, like contact paper, right. over the steel doors. And then they put the trim the oak trim over the, over the steel door, so then you don't have that creaking because you have uh, a more uh, more integrity in the structure. But initially, this car does creak. Uh huh. Power plant on this was a flathead six. Uh, eight. Eight flathead eight. Yes. Uh huh. And it has the uh, fluid drive, uh -huh. and that was a big deal because it was kind of the the, the, the first pre-automatic transmission. It was not entirely. It has a clutch, but not entirely manual but not entirely automatic. Which is always still kind of a mystery to me. Well it's a mystery how it works uh -huh. when it works. And, it, and you didn't enter these in any drag races. The acceleration was uh, pretty slow because of that. That Not only that, the weight of the car is, uh -huh. is, is heavy too. So it, it, it is not a fast car but it's a smooth car. It's quiet and once you get going it's, it's, it's a nice car to drive. Is the, does the general public still know what a Woody is or do you get reactions it's like what is that I didn't know they made cars with wood on them and or people still know well I think over the last couple of years well, there's been a real resurgence in Woody's and there's a lot of uh, Woody shows and Woody organizations and so I think that the, there is a uh, I don't know there, there's kind of like a homing device people come to the car and they like it and the warmth of the wood uh, I think a lot of people don't realize that Chrysler made one I think they think of the Fords and the Mercury's and the uh, Buicks and Oldsmobiles that were Woody's. Uh -huh. More before they think of this.
stepping back in time a little bit again here, a 1928 Cadillac. Dual Cal Phaeton. Dual Cal Phaeton. Uh, and we're going to talk about what makes it a dual Cal Phaeton, but spectacular car. This, this is, must have been going down the street back in 1928. It must have stopped traffic and pedestrians and everybody. It uh, was quite the car for the time. I think at that point, Cadillac was the standard of the world. Mm -hmm. and. Um, this particular model with the dual Cal Phaeton was a very elegant car and it would not probably be your first car which at that point would have even you know ramped up its uh, significance in a family more. A family might have a, uh, a closed sedan or, or a town car and then you'd have this as more of a fun car. Uh, it's a real interesting car from the standpoint that uh, while you don't crank it you do have to pump air into the gas tank to get the car started. Uh, the engine has priming cups, if that doesn't work. And uh, the car has uh, all of this bright work is uh, nickel plate. Uh, chrome was not commercially viable until about 1929. Uh, so uh, one of the big things on the car is keeping it shiny and as fast as you polish it, it tarnishes. And it's uh, a merry-go-round on that. So as fast as you're done, you come back two days later, gee, do we ever do it? But it's a, it's a great running car, a very low geared. Uh, second winds, by the time you get the third, it's, it's just dandy. It's okay. not a fast car, but it, and it's not a smooth car. It's, it's a very stiff suspension, uh, but uh, that's what it was at the time. And again, you gotta go back and say, well, what were other cars like? And probably not as nice as this. So it, it takes time to get to the speed you want, but how, how is it cornering? Is it still oh, a nice car a to truck. drive? It's a truck. It's so a truck. Okay. It, don't, it does not steer real easy. Uh -huh. It doesn't do anything real easy. Okay. But again, I think for this period of time, it was probably pretty hot stuff. Why didn't somebody, a dual call Phaeton, where you can open it up in the back, somebody gets in there, they got the blanket around them or, or whatever, they can stay really cozy. Why didn't they just buy a sedan? Oh, I think during the summer you take the top down okay. and there's nothing like it. Uh -huh. And the car, when the top is down, it is a different car. It, it has no, I mean, it, right now it looks very formal and you take the top down, it looks really sporty. sporty. Mm -hmm. So it has a totally different look. I, I kind of wonder if people who own these cars didn't live in the Hamptons and this was kind of their summer beach car and maybe in the evenings they put the top uh, up you know, for, keep themselves warm, but in the uh, afternoons you go out for a drive and you drop the top. The other uh, rare uh, item on the car is the, uh, the, the crier on, on the, uh, uh, the hood, and that's a real rare hood ornament. Uh, and the other uh, item on the car of interest, of course, is the, uh, are the pilot rays. And a lot of people think that uh, Lexus this year came out with a car where the headlights move with the steering wheel. And then they come here and they look at the car and, and they say, well, gee, that isn't such a revolutionary development after all. So as the steering wheel turns, those lower lights will turn and uh, follow the car. Would this generally have been a chauffeur-driven car? It could have been, either way. Mm -hmm. So the, the owners could ride in the back and the, could be all bundled up and the chauffeur's up front getting a little bit chilly, but doing all right. Well, at least he had a roof over his head. Aaron Weiss, thank you so much for having us as your guest here at the Flying A Garage. Fantastic facility. Well, thank you for coming. All right, and thank you for watching the Vintage Vehicle Show. Hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you again next time. Until then, bye-bye.